Okay. They say there's two things that most people fear more than anything else. Public speaking and giving a party where nobody shows up. So thank you for coming to my party. <laughs> okay, what we're gonna be talking about today is a very fascinating process or a thing that I got to do uh, for command prompt for a company where we migrated them from Sybase ASE 15.7 to Postgres 9.3. It was a very interesting journey. So I'm Jeff Ross, I live in Montana. Um, that's my lady Laura in the picture there. I'm a DBA at Command Prompt. And that picture is also from our deck, so that's the view we get all the time. Yeah. And people said, you don't wanna to go to New York City? <laughs> well, not and leave that. So, this will be a story of one migration from Sybase to Postgres, but it won't be the same as your story if you ever get to do a migration like this, because I'm sure every one of them is different. But I'll tell you what we did and why we did it and how we ended up doing it, and maybe that'll give you guys a jump start on doing one of these. So, here's what our requirements were from the customer. Move from Sybase ASC 15.7 to 9.3 in an eight hour window. This was about a 50 gigabyte database under pretty heavy load. And they have actually three data centers, and one in Australia, one in Europe, and one in Virginia. The Virginia one was the, the great big one. The other two they were able to do in substantially less amount of time. They provided us with a Postgres schema. And the reason they did that was that all their application code was built for Sybase, which is case sensitive, so they could uppercase everything and or uppercase you know like table names and it had to match that so when they made a schema they put an underlying schema underneath that was regular postgres and they made it views on top of that that were also camel cased so uppercase and lowercase letters but postgres folded it all down into lowercase anyway so as far as sybase was concerned they didn't have to or as far as their apps were concerned they didn't have to change anything but as far as postgres worked and it just was automatic that it went right in so then the third thing that was really the most interesting was they wanted to, after they went live, track all changes that we made to Postgres in case they had to fall back to Sybase. Because there were, you know, this was a big organization, there were a lot of corporate layers, and it was a big selling job that they, that their people had to do to try and get, even get post, to try Postgres. So they, the corporate people said, we want to fall back just in case it doesn't work. We want to be able to roll back to Sybase, but we don't want to lose anything in the process. So we had to track all the changes, inserts, updates, and deletes, and be able to put them into a form that they could reinsert back into Sybase and just take right off again. So first steps. Um, I was told that I was going to get to work on this project, and it was going to be converting Sybase to Postgres, and I go, Sybase? <laughs> I'd, I'd heard of it. That's about it. Um, so the first thing I had to do was actually learn how to connect to Sybase. We had to do some VPN stuff to get set up with the company. And once I got into that, you know, it's like then I'm in a Sybase box, but I have no idea how to launch a client, how to connect to it. So that was the first thing. Um, Sybase has documentation online. They have about a million iterations of basically the same thing, but it is pretty awful. I mean, when we're coming from a Postgres background where our documentation is bar none, superb, for in every way you can imagine, to come and look at the Sybase documentation was like night and day. Plus, their command line tools are really awful. The command line uh, client for Sybase is called ISQL. It doesn't even have read line. It's like Oracle's command line client. So it's, it was, you know, as I read one, one person said, it was never meant to be used for anything other than to say that we have a command line client because you really can't work from it at all. Um, so SQSH is replacement command line for ISQL. It's much better, but it still has problems. The problems, oops, sorry, the problems were is that it's built on free TDS and free, free TDS is a pretty buggy library. So there were things like, you know, we'd use SQSH to connect to Sybase, but if you're trying to run a long running query on it, it would just time out. So I actually ended up using ISQL for a lot of the things that we're gonna be doing 
um, just because SQSH couldn't handle it. But if anything, I was when I was learning Sybase, SQSH was a much better replacement. So, our, my first thought after I got that far was, uh, in Montana, there's a road sign that I've seen, and it says, choose your rut carefully because you're going to be in it for the next five miles. So, um, that's not actually the rutted road. That's my nephew's mud bog truck where we were at that day, but it's a good, good image of that. So, our first attempt was that a TDS foreign data wrapper had very recently been released. It was just like maybe out two weeks before we started on this project. So, you guys know what foreign data wrappers are and how they work? Okay, everybody? All right, so then I won't go into how, how all they work and all that kind of stuff. But there again, it's a free TDS and free TDS development packages needed, same as SQSH, so it has inherited the same bugs as the free TDS libraries. So, but it lets you do seamless data transfer from Sybase to Postgres. So when you create the, um, the foreign data or the server, you're actually talking to Sybase and it does on the fly data conversion for most data types, except for timestamps. So that was, looked like it was gonna be pretty handy to have. Here's how you make a foreign server, but you know, we'll probably just kind of skip over this, but it, it's basic stuff. It's all on our Postgres documentations. Um, you just create an extension for the TDS foreign data wrapper and then go for it. So that would be how you would do it if this was actually gonna work but it wouldn't, and it wouldn't because it works, but it was excruciatingly slow, and we had gazillions of rows that needed to be migrated. So I didn't see any way that we could do that conversion or you know, do this kind of data import with um, the foreign data wrapper. It just was gonna be way too slow. Plus, you know, what we talked about with free TDS, buggy, it truncates your data at certain times, it'll lose connections, so, I mean, and it had, there were some other things I don't even remember, I don't have the details anymore, but they had all to do with Univercare and Unitext, which in Sybase is uh, even more interesting. We'll get to that in a minute. So, it was time to rethink, but fortunately, it wasn't too late to change ruts. We'd just barely gotten into the progress, so there was a nice hill, high spot that we could jump out of that rut. So I started looking around and there were a few success stories that were available on the web. P places where people would talk about how they'd done it and you know, um, the best ones that I found that gave us the most detail used the Sybase BCP program to copy data from Sybase, but you have to write it to a file. And then they would secure copy those files to the Postgres server and import them into PSQL. When you're talking 50 gigabytes, that is a lot of delay from the time you start until the time you can secure copy those across or even CAD them across into uh, Postgres. It's like an extra step that we really wanted to avoid. So, BCP is sort of like copy, but it has some really interesting limitations. For one thing, it can't write to standard out. It has to write to a file. Another thing is, it doesn't know how to do CSV. So we had to do, uh, so, and it, well, there's no other way you can quote things. So we had to do the quoting for it. And there was no data type conversion whatsoever at all. It just takes the stuff, because it's meant to transfer from one Sybase to another Sybase. So there were some interesting hitches in the get along ahead. Well, so what I got to thinking, all right, so we got to write to a file, but we don't want to write to a real file. What else is like a file? A FIFO. A FIFO is a first in, first out pipe. It's a named pipe. So you actually make a file with the make FIFO temp, Sybase FIFO is how I did it. And then when you write to that pipe, it actually will send the data across the pipe to whatever's reading it on the other end. So FIFOs were, that worked great. It was a lifesaver in this case. So some FIFOisms that we learned along the way is you have to start reading from the FIFO before you start writing to the FIFO. If you don't, if you start writing to the FIFO, you'll fill up the buffer pretty quick and then everything just stalls. And it's sometimes I couldn't get it to restart once we connected to it. So it was easy to start reading to the FIFO before there's anything being written to it and then it just picks it up in midstream. We found some null bytes in the data coming out of Sybase and our folks at the company had no idea how they got there. But what happened was as soon as that null byte went into the pipe, 
it stopped it dead. It just completely killed the FIFO. So we had to fix that. So here's how we had to fix BCP to do the things we needed it to do. Um, couldn't do CSV, so we had to do all the escaping for it. Um, so I created Sidebase views to do that, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so we were using SQSH to query the Sybase equivalent of the information schema and actually pull column names and the data types from that. Then I would wrote a Python script to massage that data and put it all in the form we needed. So our BCP options we used was you got to make, the, even though these things say like minus C is care types, well, you really got to do that all the time with BCP, otherwise it doesn't work. <laughs> so. Then T, we set the column delimiter to a comma because we're, we're going to do CSV. Uh, the hyphen J is to let uh, BCP know that it was sending UTF-8, otherwise it didn't want to read anything. And T was the truncation length, which is automatically set to 16K. So we just set that as the default. Yeah, truncate your data. Well, that's a great database. So here's how we did the data conversion in the view. There's a convert function built into Sybase that you can convert a data type to another data type. It's sort of like casting, but it's a little different. And some of the things that we were converting had to be run through the convert. We couldn't do a cast. And it is really slow. So tables that we had to do a lot of conversions in, it took quite a bit longer to import than we would have had to if, they, you know, if we'd had a better way to cast that data. So ints and big ints were okay. No, no change needed there. Care and ver care, we had to, because we didn't, couldn't quote the thing, we had to start off with a, a quote and then trim out all the extra crap on the end of the, uh, the very curve column that we were using, string replace any single quotes that were any you know, uh, examples of a double quote in the text, like if somebody said, you know, he said, quote, quote, this, we had to change that to two quotes and then add the other quote on the end. So basically we're doing the same thing that a regular CSV conversion would do except we had to do it by hand, well, or in this script. Uni Univercare and Unitext <clears throat> ha also have to run through convert, and you can see there where you convert it to Vercare at 16K and in the Univer column and still put the quotes around it. So anything that was over 16,384 Unicode bytes, which is actually a double byte, so 8K was truncated. That's a problem. Timestamps. Also, you ha we had to convert because they look like a timestamp in Sybase, but Postgres didn't know how to read them, so you can convert to a different, more uniform type timestamp with the convert thing, and it was like you had to tell it how long the string was you're converting, which is 19 characters long, and to choose the output format of 23, which is, you know, that's all Sybase specific stuff. So here's how we set up the FIFO. I made a command that said, Pipe all the stuff through. You said to take out the null bytes because we don't want them to get into the thing at all. That's all coming through standard out, so pipe that into Postgres, and then that's all our connection string. And then just copy the Postgres table with all the columns listed out in our string from standard in with CSV and put it in the SES database. Next line is where we start reading from the FIFO and piping that across SSH to Postgres user, then run the command and background it so that it just automatically goes. Yeah? You mentioned that you know, when you do BCP, you cannot compress, right? You can't compress. Right. It's supposed to be text. Is it binary or a text output? It does text output okay. if you run it through the conversion. So once you do BCP, after the data is output, you can compress, right? We might be able to, to have done that. Yep. Yeah. Where were you when I needed that input? Time to transfer or network reuse. Time what? Time to transfer because it is compressed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, once we got everything working, our we were transferring um, in pretty good speed. So we didn't have a problem with speed then, except for the conversion process, and it was the conversion process that was the slow part. So what is the conversion? Uh, conversion to be done in the Postgres. You can just output whatever. Right. <clears throat> I tried that, except that then I would have had to figure out how to input it into Postgres without quoting everything. 
So I, it was like one of those things that we, we kind of standard on pretty soon that we would you know use CSV, which should be standard, and pipe it across and go from there. But yeah, I mean, we tried a lot of different variations on that, and this seemed to work, and it was pretty easy to implement. Once I wrapped my head around what we actually had to do. So we put it all together. We used ISQL to connect to Sybase and drop any previous views that may have been there from another previous attempt, because it won't you you can't create or replace a view in Sybase. So we had to drop the view, use ISQL to create a view that was specifically designed to not only order the columns but convert the data and do the CSV conversion or the you know the um, yeah with the quotes. Set up the FIFO, then use BCP to copy the data out to the FIFO, and then which would pipe the data over to SSH on PSQ to PSQL on the Postgres server. So that was our basic process. And once I got that working with one table, which was all I was worried about initially, was getting the thing working. Then I remember it was like we had an aha moment, and I even remember saying in the chat room, it's like you know what, we might actually be able to pull this off. Because <laughs> up until that point, I hadn't figured out a good way to get the data across to Postgres yet. So we were going to do that for all the tables, except that some of the tables were over 100 million rows in Sybase. So we decided to part or partition those on IDs right off the get-go. Um, some of the tables, the schemas didn't match. So like in Sybase, they would have a data type of one kind and then we couldn't convert to the data type that they had set it up in Postgres. So I had to write a special case for that, which is what I did in this massive Postgres script that I'll show you at the end that to you know, make a special case for those instances. Then the other tables that we could do that, we, it worked pretty well. So like any of these kind of projects, it was test, fix, test. Reiterate, you know, just keep iterating over and over and over again until it starts running. What really was helpful is that they have they had a nightly applications QA server that we could connect to, which only had like that day's snapshot of data. So it was lots of data that we could play with, but it wasn't the hundred million rows. And there were still enough outliers in that data that anything that we were going to see later on down the line would show up and trip the. FIFO or trip Postgres or something like that. So then I had another thing I'd have to go in and try and figure out how to fix. So I was really happy with that. And they continued to test that as I went on to work on the rollback script. So what we decided to do was write a trigger and, and do it after the insert into Postgres that would, you know, catch any inserts, updates, deletes, you know, to standard trigger. But decided to do it inside a new, a new schema so it was separate from the regular database so that when we got done we just dropped the changes schema and it's all over with. All that stuff is gone then. Um, because speed was more of the essence than in the way we were just making all these scripts to import data from, I actually made a call map table so it mapped the Sybase tables and its column name script that got ran after we were done. Okay, so we still hadn't forgot about that truncation problem. It really was the other elephant in the room. Sybase can also cast Univericare and Unitext to text with no truncation. So you could take those Unitext character or fields that were 30k long and cast them to text and we'd get it all. 
but you, you can't escape it because you can't add any other characters in Sybase to text. So it's like the view that I was writing to make um, everything CSV compliant would not work because you couldn't add the colons around a text column. So more Sybase fun. <laughs> So I was looking around and found a program on the internet that I kind of wished I had found when we started, and that was PG Bulk Load. PG Bulk Load you would be basically using the same idea, but instead of piping to PSQL, we'd pipe to PG Bulk Load. PG Bulk Load doesn't write any wall at all, and which was just fine because we weren't doing any kind of replication on this data yet. Um, it also allows you to rewrite the data midstream. So theoretically, I could have taken those text columns and added the, you know, the CSV stuff to make it work right there. But, whoops, we were too late. So PG bulk load, you know, can also do that. But when you are doing the PSQL, instead of writing copy, you can also select the task column. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and we were still looking at trying to finish that under in the eight-hour window. So. Yeah. Well, what we got to by the time I found PG bulk load, it was too late to change that rut. We had committed so much of that, and basically it was, you know, I was really trying to sell them on the idea that we could try that for a little bit, and if it worked, we'd probably be faster because we were avoiding writing the wall, and it would get past the truncation problem. But they said, we don't have time to go back and start all the QA testing again. We've got to, you know, we're just going to keep going the way we're going because it's working, and I'll, we'll figure out how to migrate the stuff. So what we ended up doing was we switched the convert for Unitext and Univericare to where it was gonna cut everything off at 8,000 characters, which made sure that we didn't actually truncate and leave an imp, uh, half of a string in the text column. Um, then we would go back after the import and run a select on the Sybase to copy the ID and that data column to a thing and then run that as an, make that manual update script and put in the proper values for quoting it and then import that into Postgres. And they took care of all that right after the migration. So, and as it turned out, um, there were only a handful of records that actually got past that 16K that they were not willing to just let go. So it, was, it turned out to be not that big of a problem, even though it sure looked like it was gonna be a deal breaker for a while. So when we got ready to go, and they did all this for us, you know, it was like, so I gave them all the stuff they needed to do, and they're the ones that ran it. But they ran this, the full-blown Python create import script that we've got, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, then we secure, copied the output files that it writes from, or to the Sybase server, shell into the Sybase server, run a single import shell script, it runs through this folder and runs every create view or drop view, create view, copy from B across BCP into Postgres. So then they did the update on the few columns they wanted to save. They added the rollback trigger. So here's what they gave me when they were from the trenches when they got done. That they imported the two smaller data centers first and had no issues, which was great. Then they went to do the, the big data center. There was one table that we'd imported a gazillion times during testing that just was all of a sudden so much slower coming from the Sybase side that they decided to stop it right then and switch to, use, to importing from a staging server which with data that was one day old. So they had everything except the last current date in the staging server. They were able to import that and then use the same basic premise to just import that last days from the production server and pipe that back into Postgres, so no data loss. Usually this happens, uh, you know, because during the uh, business day, the server will be very, you know, loaded, right? So at that time, if you try to copy the large table, it will take more time. Maybe other activities of the network as well. Yeah. So when we do this kind of activity, like 100 to terabytes we need to move from one to another, we can order which table should be migrated. So you can control, you know which table gets migrated, Right. Right. You can do like the last table during overnight hours. Yeah. And you 
part of the table in this uh, system. Okay. Sure. Well, the good news was, though, they were done in less than, than their eight-hour window. And they fired it up. They had a couple of things that had slipped through from their app side that they had to fix the next morning, but they were very minor. So it was an easy fix for them, and um, they were very happy campers. So that's it. Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is what Postgres has. So I'm, I'm curious as, as to how things are structured on their Sybase side versus how things are structured on the Postgres side. Do they, the equivalence that I see is, is a database on a, on a Sybase would turn into a schema on Postgres. So maybe I'm, that, that's not the best approach. Do you know what, how they go about that? They had a separate schema for a lot of their stuff. It was in the uh, web app schema. In fact, I should just, let's see. Um, this is the basic, or this is the actual final version of the import script as it came across, but it was still the version we were testing against the nightly server. Um, but their schema for Sybase will come over here. This is, yeah, we query the information schema for Postgres, but they, so it was like a, they have an, an owner and a schema name and everything, and a lot of times you have to put all three of those things in to, to know that it's talking to the right table. Right. So maybe I'm not understanding your question right about the... Yeah, it's just your database owner and then the, 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 actual, the actual table. Object. Yeah, object, it can, right, yeah. Right. Um, but I'm, with, with, with Postgres, I mean, for example, um, databases in Sybase can talk to each other. So between one database, you can refer to another database just by you know, putting you know, op, like database.owners.name and, and they can talk to each other. Uh, not so much with Postgres. Yeah. If you've got things in different databases, so if you, if you want a way to get around Yeah. Is that pretty much is the way that that that's right. done that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what you do is you have um, so the Oracle is the same way. Okay. So in not the same way as Sybase, but in that it <coughs> is a database and maybe you guys can comment. Uh, in Postgres you have your database. And in fact this is a mistake a lot of developers make is that they will have multiple databases How yep. do you, you know, migrate the permissions on the, uh, the um, We didn't worry anything about permissions at all when we migrated. I mean, because the idea was to get everything across first, and then we can always add permissions to Postgres. I had identical problem of migrating from one database to another, and I used uh, my tool which was available 15 years back with the SQL server. I can supply data to you. Did you try and then do it with, I know you have done a lot of work to make this to work. Mm -hmm. Did you try any of the tool available, open source tools or things like that, to do this for you? I couldn't find anything that would do it right out of the box when I first started looking for it. And maybe I just wasn't looking in the right place. When did you do this, last two, three years or a long time back? Oh no, it finished, they did the migration just before Christmas. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, so I think something like that. It was there on SQL Server 7. Yeah, it must be the APU. It is a long time since I used it. Yeah, so there's, there's other, I mean, like Kettle would be one example, but I think there's something we're talking so about what it would, right now. Mm -hmm. So what it would do is like, the, if you, because since you're running Sybase, you know, if there was also an SQL Server instance, or, you know, since my, there must be Microsoft running, right? One candidate it could be. And those were the tools available during those times, because you know, you are not talking about talking about one table. Yeah. You are talking about multiple tables. 
right? A sole procedure, function, mm. right? All of those things could be, you know, the tools were available at that time. I don't know which are available now. Well, the, one of the problems I had with Sybase was there isn't even a developer's version available for download anymore. You know, it's like there there was one on the server and you could fill out all the forms you wanted to and you'd get right down to the point where you click the download button and it would just single line on the screen that says not available. So, you know, it's like there were, a, I'm sure there were a lot of Sybase tools. And one of the things that kind of came down to me through the through our company contact was that all of those Sybase tools had gotten really expensive. So I didn't know what they had and, you know, and they kind of made it pretty clear that, you know, there were still a lot of people at the company that were not really much in favor of doing this migration from Sybase. So I didn't really have anybody there that I could say, so, you know, like, how would you do this? <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting. I mean, I, I learned a lot about um, the way Sybase works in doing this process. And it may not, like I said, this is, this is our journey for this migration. It won't be yours. And yeah. We'll probably never have to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's hope we do, because we've learned a lot the first go. So the second one, it will go a lot quicker. Another option is JDBC. You know, if you can connect JDBC to Sybase, it will be a little slower. Yeah. To copy large amount of data in a specific time frame, but it is an option. You can connect from JDBC to Sybase or any other database, read and write. Ah, okay. So it, it almost is like a foreign data wrapper of some kind then. If you can read from one and write to the other through the same connector. Yeah. Well, that's interesting to know. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to page through this thing. It's long and it's, you know, basically a lot. It's three sections. One, the, the first one does the... Uh, all the tables that we were gonna partition. So we made the partition tables and then we would insert directly into them because it was quicker. Then it does, the next section does all the special casing for the things where there were weird data type changes. And then the third one just does everything else. Um, and when we're done, we would end up with, these are the files that we would end up running for each table. So we'd drop the view and you know, like here's the, um, the dot makes this a table that without the owner and all that. So this is the for the API user, the zero to two million table. Then we would you know, run that Sybase view. Here's the view that we would do it. These are all ints, so they don't need any conversion. Here's one of the uh, regular uh, Vercares that does need to be converted for CSV. And where our AP user ID is greater than zero and less than two million and go, and it would start shooting across the FIFO like crazy as soon as we ran, you know, so we would, um, let's see here, right down here. Remove the FIFO, make a FIFO, load up the Sybase uh, connection variables. Here's where we talk ISQL into talking to the server. that in the table and away we would go. Now, I was worried when we did this that even with the lookup table, it was gonna be slow. But we, we got a query from them the other day about an auto vacuum issue they thought, issue they thought they were having. 
And so I had her run like a, a basic table to show, you know, when auto vacuum is triggering, how many, how much churn there's been in the table to see if auto vacuum should have run on them and didn't yet. And in that list was still the log changes table. So they haven't dropped the schema yet. They're still tracking the changes. And at the time we did that, it had 105 live, 105 million live tuples. So a lot of rows that they're tracking. And I, so I created a new ticket in our ticketing system and said, you know what? I don't think you guys are gonna be rolling back to Sybase now. I'll bet we can drop that changes schema any day. <laughs> but I haven't heard back from them yet. So maybe they have and, and you know, just didn't let us know or maybe it's still there doing its job. Um, we haven't heard of anything, and we haven't really been, Mike, but we did, we, we did kind of pre-tune the, the server. And then, you know, so not only for the, the actual import, which is, you know, different settings than after they're running it in production. And one of the other things that we were a little bit worried about was they wanted to run Postgres on NFS mount. So, you know, it was like, are we going to have enough bandwidth? Is it going to be able to keep up? Well, that's not been an issue at all for them. So, yeah, it was, it was great. And they and really they basically said if we can't run it on NFS we're probably not switching because it was a that much of a part of their infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Besides the big uh, the data cutover, were there any other objects that were carried over? And if so, were there any other changes that had to be made that they thought could be functional or whatever? They had a pile of stored procedures, and originally they wanted us to rewrite those. But when I got started doing that, they had decided that as a part of their QA um, team would rewrite those functions and a lot of them they were just going to drop because they were they were um, well when I started I converted a couple of them before they gave us that point and it was like wow they you know this is 300 lines of code that you could probably do in 30 so it was yeah anyway so the, I don't know what they uh, what they carried over or anything like that but yeah but they did yeah they did the cutover Right. They wanted to, you know, they kind of let me know when they were doing it and you want to know if I'd be around <laughs> like on the weekend. I said, well, sure, you know, you, I'll be here if you need me, but I never heard from them. So, which was good. Yeah. Thank you. So, anything else? <laughs> there were three other talks that I wanted to go to yeah. at this very time slot. <laughs> so I was talking to Jimmy. He's like, it's great stuff, but man, you're going up against the JSON. Yeah. Had a room yep. Right. Here, so. right. <laughs> yep. That's okay. Well, thanks again for coming to my party. <laughs> Thank you.